cases are because of iron deficiency. In chronic kidney disease, anemia burden gradually increases with the increasing of the stage and it reaches to almost 70 to 80 percent when CKD stage 4 and 5 arise. Anemia and chronic kidney disease is also directly related with the quality of life as well as with increased cardiovascular mortality and morbidity. There are several causes of uh, iron deficiency in chronic kidney disease. We all know that GI losses are common cause because our CKD population has CAD also, so they are on antiplatelets. They are given anticoagulants for dialysis as well as they are on anticoagulations for chronic uh, peripheral vascular disease. They are taking painkillers and they have some compromised mucosal integrity, so they have iron loss in gut. Besides this, they have malabsorption also because they are fluid overload, so their mucosal edema in gut causes lesser absorption of iron. And these CKD patients are on proton pump inhibitors as well as phosphate binders to decrease phosphorus levels in the blood. Besides, this is malnutrition because chronic kidney disease patients, they have less appetite, so they are eating less. And when they are eating less, so amount of iron which can go with the diet is also less. This is one reason. And another group of reason is inflammation. Our chronic kidney disease patient has got some micro-inflammation environment, so they have endothelial dysfunctions. Pro-inflammatory cytokine levels are elevated in our chronic kidney disease populations. We have found that levels of interleukin-6, interleukin-1, TNF-alpha, which are known as pro-inflammatory cytokines, they are elevated. So these pro-inflammatory cytokines inhibit the response of erythropoietin. So we got lesser response with erythropoietin. At the same time, these pro-inflammatory markers suppress the erythro erythrocyte process and they cause enhanced apoptosis of erythro erythrocyte progenitors. These inflammatory states also cause elevated level of hepcidin. So production is high in of hepcidin as well as excretion is also less. So hepcidin levels are elevated in chronic kidney population, which leads to decreased absorption of iron from the gut as well as decreased release of iron from reticular endothelial cell pooling. So we have an iron deficiency in the blood in chronic kidney disease, and we have a functional iron deficiency also. That is, despite iron is there in the store, but it is not available for utilization by erythrocyte precursors. Symptoms of iron deficiency with or without anemia. So we have to understand that iron does not cause only anemia. Iron also causes a group of symptoms, a group of comorbidity, which may or may not occur with anemia. So patients of iron deficiency, they have shortness of breath, they have fatigue, they have reduced physical performance and endurance, they have decreased concentration span, and this has been seen in kids, especially the people 15 to 17 years of age, who are eating less or eating not proper iron dose, they have a defect in concentration span. And when iron is given, everything improves. These patients of iron deficiency also have reduced vitality. They have increased susceptibility for infections. They have pale skin, hair loss, and bitter nails. Controlled clinical studies have shown that there is a direct association of iron deficiency with fatigue reduced physical performance and impaired cognitive functions irrespective of whether anemia is present or not present. The challenge of diagnosing iron deficiency or treating iron deficiency is big. Why iron deficiency is not diagnosed easily in our group of populations? The first important point is that we don't have definitive parameters which should be known to every physician that these parameters should be done in all our patients who have different type of symptoms which i just said secondly our patient has one or other chronic morbidity they have ckd diabetes hypertension or something else so their symptoms of iron deficiency are masked or taken for granted for this chronic illness so we basically miss the symptoms of iron deficiency thinking that they are because of some chronic disease Thirdly, we often understand that iron deficiency and anemia are interchangeable. So we do not suspect iron deficiency in a patient who has near normal hemoglobin. While the fact is that iron deficiency itself is a syndrome, itself is a disease. Fourth point is the iron deficiency in our country and especially worldwide also is considered a nutritional disorder. 
while it itself is a disease and it has got its all implication on the health. And last reason is that we don't have a definitive guidelines how iron deficiency should be suspected and what tests should be performed to doc document it. Now coming on to the causes of anemia in renal disease. In kidney disease, we have impaired erythropoietin production where as we all know that when kidney function decreases, GFR decreases, the production of erythropoietin which exclusively or say more than 90% of erythropoietin is produced from the kidney also decreases. So as the process, as the CKD is staging progress, production of erythropoietin also decreases and anemia becomes prevalent in chronic kidney disease in almost 80 to 90% of the population by the time CKD stage reaches 4 or 5. The second point in CKD is that patient RBC red blood cells has decreased lifespan. Normally RBC lifespan is 120 days but in uremic, uremic environment this decreases to 60 to 80 days so they have less survival. Thirdly renal failure occurs so a lot of metabolic product waste accumulate in the body inflammatory cytokines are elevated half certain levels are increasing which causes inhibition of the use of iron by the iron hemoglobin producing mechanisms. Blood loss is also common in chronic kidney disease because of too much sampling, loss in the uh, tubing and dialyzer. And as I said, chronic inflammation is a condition which occurs in chronic kidney disease. So this pro-inflammatory cytokines also inhibits the absorption of iron from the gut as well as inhibits the release of iron from the stores for the use of iron hemoglobin production. We call it functional iron deficiency. So here you can see in what happens in pro-inflammatory state. In pro-inflammatory state in CKD, pro-inflammatory cytokines are elevated which leads to increased production of hepcidin and along with that decreased GFR also causes lesser excretion of hepcidin. So hepcidin levels are elevated in CKD. Hepcidin inhibits the, uh, the absorption of iron from the basolateral surface of enterocytes. So basically iron absorption from the gut decreases Hepcidin also inhibits the release of iron from the iron stores from the reticular endothelial system. So despite iron stores are adequate, ferritin is normal, iron cannot be utilized by hemoglobin forming mechanisms. So we call it functional iron deficiency. So it has been recommended that whenever we are going to treat anemia in chronic kidney disease, we start erythrocyte stimulating agent, we call it erythropoietin. The moment erythropoietin is started, it, is, it uses iron from the already existing uh, storage. So gradually, so quickly over a period of time, iron deficiency starts occurring in the patients. So it has been advised that whenever we are treating anemia and chronic kidney disease, and whenever we are planning to start erythro, um, ESAs, erythrocyte stimulating agents, we should replenish the iron in the body and the recommended dose is it should be given at least 1 gram or 1000 milligram per month. In orally we can give up to 30 milligram per day but I'll tell you what is the problem with the oral supplementation of iron as compared to IV. So I would prefer to say that we should give at least 1000 milligram iron per month for at least 2 to 3 months whenever we are starting ESAs in chronic kidney disease patient. Studies have shown that adequate iron availability increases the erythropoiesis and reduces the requirement of ESA, which is a costly medicine. So, how to approach or how to work up a patient of anemia and chronic kidney disease? So, work up of anemia requires the basic uh, things that we should do a hemoglobin concentration, we should do RBC red blood cell indices. Especially, we should look at the MCV. If MCV is less than 82, that means there is iron deficiency. Absolute reticulocyte count should be normal. If it is too high, that we, then we have we can suspect some other thing like hemolysis. We should check iron stores and availability of iron. Iron stores are checked by serum ferritin. But we should remember that in states of inflammation, this serum ferritin levels may be five falsely high. So we need to check the iron supply for erythropoiesis. This is checked by transferrin saturation test or by percentage of hypochromic RBCs. C-reactive protein is done in all these patients because we want to know the level of inflammation in the body. When 
most of the time 90 percent of the time the iron deficiency is the common cause and we find it and we correct it but many times the iron, def uh, iron deficiency is not the cause and anemia is persisting then we have to work up for other things like b12 or folate deficiency test for hemolysis we should suspect multiple myeloma especially anemia is refractory and hypercalcemia is there bone marrow examination may be required to see how is the marrow responding to given iron and erythropoietin and we should always rule out uh, occult blood in the stool because that could be a cons persistent cause of loss of uh, blood in the gut Now coming on to the treatment options for iron deficiency. As we all know that oral iron preparations are available. They are easily can be purchased. They are low cost. So this is the first choice. Intravenous irons are also available. They are costly, but they have several advantages. Oral iron, the problem I'll tell you that uh, most of the preparations which are available, they have many kind of uh, GI side effects they cause constipation, diarrhea, they interfere a lot with the drugs, with the meal, and the amount of iron absorbed from the gut of given oral dose is hardly 10 to 15 percent. So, if there is a deficiency, is only mild and patient is not chronic kidney disease, and uh, then we can try oral iron. Otherwise, IV iron is recommended when the deficiency is moderate to severe, or we want to have a quick response to hemoglobin. So whenever we, we are wishing to rapid repletion of iron store, intravenous iron is recommended. Fat cell transfusions are required when hemoglobin is very low, patient um, requires dialysis. So we can give fat cell along with dialysis to rapid correct the hemoglobin. Erythropoid stimulating agents are recommended in all CKD patients and the response is enhanced if IV iron is also given along with that. So indications of iron therapies. So whenever we find a CKD patients, whether patient is on dialysis or not on dialysis, we need to assess the iron parameters. So serum ferritin and transparent saturation is done. In all dialysis patients, whenever parameters are deficient, we should give intravenous iron therapy, which is recommended and established therapies. If patient is not on dialysis, then we can give either oral or IV. But if the requirement is moderate to severe and we want to rapidly replenish the stores, then intravenous is recommended. If hemoglobin response is insufficient despite replenishing the iron stores, then if, if the, uh, ESAs are started. Now the question is whether we should give oral or intravenous iron. So that is the question number one. And the answer is if patient is on hemodialysis, there is no question that we should give oral iron because we know that oral iron is inferior to intravenous iron in CKD patients and patient is already going for dialysis. We already have an access to the systemic circulation. So why not we give intravenous iron and rapidly replenish the stores? There are several oral formulations are available. There are iron compounds, complexes and elemental iron. And as we all, I have already told you the limitations with the oral iron, a lot of interactions with many drugs, especially phosphate binders, PPIs, tetracycline, a lot of interactions with the meal also. So oral iron, we don't prefer in our chronic kidney disease populations. Intravenous iron are the choice of uh, therapy in all CKD patients, especially patient on hemodialysis. We have several molecules available for intravenous iron administration. Iron, iron dextran was the first which was used till 2005. Then came uh, iron gluconate, then iron sucrose, then ferriheme, and then lately we have ferric carboxymaltose. Before deciding which iron, intravenous iron is better, we should understand three things. We have to test three things in, in a given molecule which can be given iron. The one is how much maximum dose of iron can be given. So iron dextran can be given 20 milligram per gram body weight in one sitting. So we can say up to one gram in one sitting. And another is ferric carboxymaltose, which can be given one gram. So higher single dose, if it can be given in single hospitalization, single administration, then that is the beneficial effect. Another thing is how fast we can introduce or administer the given dose. So iron dextran, which can be given in a high dose up to one gram needs to be given slowly over four to six hours so in that case patient has to be in hospital on the other side 
iron sucrose and ferric carboxy maltose which can they can be given faster than dextran and third thing is the anaphylactic reaction we all know that iron dextran was an ideal molecule before 2005 because high dose can be given but though there was limitation that it has to be given over a long period of time the worst thing with the iron dextran was the dextran associated anaphylactic reactions so that's why skin sensitivity test was required with iron dextran despite negative test many patient had anaphylactic reactions during the administration and they had they had to undergo icu hospitalizations so that's why iron dextran is gradually withdrawn from the market after that come the iron sucrose we can say that it's a it's a better than iron dextran in the form of that it can be given faster and no dose to test dose is required in majority of the cases but the limitation with the iron sucrose is that we cannot introduce or it is not recommended to give more than 200 mg in the single setting so then what is the ideal so ideal molecule would be a molecule which can be given in large dose up to 1 gram in single settings that can be introduced in a very fast manner and that thing does not require any skin testing or the risk of anaphylactic reaction is very good so in that way ferric carboxy maltose is a presently available best molecule which is commonly used in all dialysis centers so uh, this is little more about the ferric carboxy molecule ferric carboxy molecule maltose is a good molecule because it does not have much immunogenicity no test dose it delivers the iron to a place where it should be so whenever it is given it is complex so it does not release the free iron immediately into the circulation so there is no free radical injury it is delivered directly to the target organs like reticular endothelial systems it leads to high utilization rate for iron so it can be immediately used for uh, erythropoiesis it gives an stable iron complex so free radical injury is less and so there is no labile iron so overall we can say that presently this is the ideal molecule which is available and presently used in many centers now let's look at the various trials ferric carboxy maltose so we have a lot of clinical trials Uh, this here i am going to a summary of 29 company sponsored intervention studies where they published 26 randomized clinical trials in nephrology we have eight randomized control trials so in ckd kedigo kedigo which is a governing body which is which gives guidelines time to time on anemia and ckd management this is kidney disease initiative global outcome uh, that is clearly given in um, recommendation that i intravenous iron in the form of ferric carboxy maltose is the preferred treatment while treating the anemia and chronic kidney disease population so coming back onto the trials we have eight clinical studies on 2800 patients they are done on peritoneal dialysis patient on dialysis hemodialysis patients no non dialysis chronic kidney disease patient as well as post transplant patients now coming on to the clinical evidence for ferric carboxy in non dialysis chronic kidney population so patients of ckd stage 4 or lesser than that who are not on any dialysis so there are several trials out of those these 5 6 are well known trials now look at this uh, find ckd trial which was published in ndt a randomized trial of intravenous ferric carboxy maltose versus oral iron so here oral iron was compared with ferric carboxy maltose so ferric carboxy maltose was given uh, in uh, so first the patient patient selection was the patients who were on whose hemoglobin between 9 to 10.5 whose egfr was less than 61 per minute so they had a ckd stage 3 or you know, 4 or 5 patients serum ferritin were less than 100 nanogram per ml that means they were iron deficient and these patients were not on previous esa the primary end point of the trial was trying to initiation of other anemia management like need of uh, esas or blood transfusion so you can see the screening was done four weeks for the washout period in which esas were stopped patient were in randomized to receive either ferric inject and the target ferritin was 400 to 600 which this was called high dose ferric inject and another was low dose ferric inject where the target ferritin was tar- 100 to 200 and this was compared with oral iron therapy ferrous sulfate study was um, analyzed at the end of 52 to 56 weeks so primary end point was 
in all the patients who received iron, whether IV or oral, four out of five patients achieved the primary endpoints. Ferry inject alone targeted targeting a range of 400 to 600 successfully reduced or avoided ESA or other anemia management measures like blood transfusion. So we can conclude in that study that uh, the primary endpoint of the study, which was the need to start ESA or blood transfusion, was least in high ferritin group, which was uh, and it was then. Uh, low ferritin was better than the oral. So high ferritin followed by low ferritin then was the oral. So this was a sequence of uh, reaching the endpoints. Here the safety measures were shown how safe is to give IVRN. So we can see that very few patients required discontinuation of intravenous iron therapy. On the other hand, oral iron therapy patient, a lot of patients had to discontinue their oral medications. So summary of this find CKD trial published in as Lancet showed that ferric carboxy maltose targeting a ferritin of 400 to 600 was shown to be significantly more effective in reducing the requirement of ESA or delaying some other measures like blood transfusions. And uh, very few side effects were seen with intravenous ferry inject as compared to oral therapies. Here you can see the one minute. Let's see the slide. And it was seen that the efficacy was higher with IV iron versus oral plus um, ESA. So here you can see one more thing that the intravenous iron fer fer inject when we were targeting a ferritin of 400 to 600, it was found to be better than the patients who were on oral iron plus ESA. So we can say that the first choice of treating anemia and CKD is giving intravenous iron. Again, you can see the safety and tolerability profile. Here on the left side, IV iron versus oral iron, you can see that ferry jet group have, has very lesser side effects. Overall serious side effects were less than 3% and overall side effects less than 7.4%. On the right, we can see the ferry carbox maltose versus iron sucrose side effects. And we can clearly say that, see that the total number of events as side effect occurring in FCM was lesser as compared to sucrose. Now this is another trial a repair idea here assessing intravenous ferric carboxy maltose in patient with iron deficiency anemia and impact on renal function. This was a randomized active controlled multicentric trial. The total number of patients were 2500. Patients inclusion criteria was GFR less than 60 or less than 90 when they have other param parameters of chronic kidney disease. Hemoglobin was less than 11.5. Patient had iron deficiency in the form of ferritin less than 100 or less than 300, but if transfer in saturation is less than 30%. Patient was stable if on ESA. Stable patient were on uh, stable parameters. They were randomized to receive either ferric carboxy maltose or iron sucrose. So there were two, two doses of ferric carboxy maltose were given 750 milligrams once a weekly for two doses. Similarly, iron sucrose was given, five doses of 200 milligram iron sucrose were given from 0 to 14. The primary endpoint was the mean change from baseline HB to highest observed HB at any point of time. And another parameter was the safety parameters. And it was found in this study, the ferric carboxy maltose was comparable to sucrose in terms of efficacy as well as the side effects. And in many, many parameters, it was statistically significant also. On, the, uh, on this bar chart, we can see that the mean, mean change in hemoglobin from the baseline was higher in I pericarboxy maltose group as compared to iron sucrose. And here on the right side, we can see patient achieving more than one gram percent increase from the baseline was higher in FCM group as compared to iron sucrose. This uh, in the same study, they have shown that what effect occurs on the storage parameters by giving ferric carboxy maltose. So on the left side, we can see then when ferric carboxy maltose was given in comparison to sucrose, the rise in mean transparent saturation levels were higher. And on the right side, you can see the effect on ferritin rise was higher with FCM as compared to iron sucrose. So basically, uh, this ferric carboxy maltose resulted into higher increase in 
transparent saturation and ferritin parameters. So summary of results in repair ID, intravenous ferric carboxymaltose by giving two infusions of 750 milligrams given one week apart was safe and efficacious. Alternative for the treatment of iron deficiency anemia in patient with CKD. FCM allows for more iron to be administered in fewer infusions, so less visit was required. Because in this study, 750 milligrams, two doses were given on zero and seventh day, while iron sucrose was given 200 milligrams on consecutive five sitting. So lesser sitting were required for ferric carboxymaltose with better results. Now we have seen this uh, effect of FCM comparing with the oral iron as well as with the iron sucrose in patients who were not on dialysis but CKD patients. Now let's see on the effect on CKD patients who are hemodialysis. So this is a study, Kovic et al. study. It was a single arm study. So patients of uh, chronic kidney disease stage 5D on hemodialysis who were anemic with the iron stores of ferritin lesser than 200 or transparent saturation less than 20%. On either were not on erythropoietin stimulating agents or on ESA with stable hemoglobin, were uh, given pericarboxymaltose 100 to 200 milligram iron at each dialysis session in patients who were on two to three times per week dialysis for a maximum of six weeks. You can see that there was a very good, good response rates. Patient responded well in terms of rise in the mean hemoglobin from the baseline as well as in the paper, in the percentage of patients who uh, got a good response in rising hemoglobin. When you look at the iron store parameters, by giving ferric carboxymaltose 200 milligram every dialysis sessions on, uh, for six weeks resulted into replenishment of the iron deficiency. So their ferritin levels increase, their transparent saturation level increase. So intravenous ferric carboxymaltose was also was associated with significant replenishment of iron deficiencies with targets of serum ferritin and transparent saturation achieved and all the doses were well tolerated in hemodialysis patients with very few side effects and a couple of patients had very adverse events but they were not related directly with the ferric carboxymaltose so overview of the results of COVID of using ferric carboxymaltose in single arm study 61.7% of patients were treatment responders, so we can say almost two-thirds of the patients responded to IVN. Mean hemoglobin rise from 9.1 to 10.3 was seen. Iron parameters were well, uh, well improved. There were not significant serious adverse events. So now coming on to the study design of uh, IV ferric carboxy muscle versus IV iron sucrose hemodialysis patient. This is another study. Eveni Coil et al. 2009. Here, patients were on maintenance hemodialysis with HB less than 11.5, ferritin less than 200, or transferrin saturation less than 20%. Either the patients were on ESA with stable hemoglobin or they were not on ESA. Patients were given ferric carboxymaltose 200 mg uh, post dialysis two to three times per week, depending on their dialysis schedule. And IV iron sucrose was also given 200 mg two to three times per week for a total. You can see that uh, intravenous ferric carboxymaltose demonstrated greater response rate in terms of rise in hemoglobin in hemodialysis patients. <clears throat> you can see the HB rise. Uh, the effect is seen by the end of the weeks. In both the patients, ferric carboxymaltose as well as iron sucrose, there was a significant rise in hemoglobin compared to the baseline. But the, when we compare the uh, rise in hemoglobin in FCM group as compared to iron sucrose, it was significant. Similarly, the ferritin and transparent saturation rise, which occurred in both the groups, the, the, there was a significant increase in ferritin transparent saturation in FCM group as compared to iron sucrose. This is, uh, this is the patients who are reaching with hemoglobin more than one gram, which was um, seen in FCM as compared to iron sucrose, which was better. And similarly, the higher mean hemoglobin increase was found in FCM group as compared to iron sucrose. So overview of results in Avenue Poil, where the pericarboxymaltose was compared to the iron sucrose in CKD patients who were on dialysis. So this pericarboxymaltose resulted in high, it resulted in increase in hemoglobin, serum ferritin, transfer solution that was higher in 
FCM goes as compared to CKD with lesser side effects. FCM was well tolerated in all hemodialysis patients and it was uh, almost comparable to iron sucrose. <laughs> so we can say that FCM is well tolerated. It leads to greater, greater response rate in terms of rise in hemoglobin, rise in ferritin, transparent saturation. It reduces the re need for ESAs and blood transfusion. This is, a, this is another finding that um, patients who are, all, are already on iron sucrose, we can switch over these patients to ferricarboxymaltose and we can find that when they are switched from uh, iron sucrose to ferricarboxymaltose and compare them, there is a significant better rise in hemoglobin as well as there is iron stores, ferritin and transferrin saturation. Now look at the clinical evidence of FCM in renal transplant. So this renal transplant patient is uh, basically they have they have compromised GFR, they have anemia also, and here the main purpose is to see the response of uh, FCM in terms of rise in hemoglobin, iron stores, as well as uh, whether it causes any drug interaction. So it was a single arm study in 44 patients, and uh, 27 patients were kidney transplant recipients. Single in injection of uh, ferric carboxymaltose was given, 100, 100 milligram, or short infusion of 500 milligram were given. Very uh, mild to transient adverse events were reported. EGFR was well maintained, so it did not uh, worsen the transplant function. So it led to uh, it resulted into conclude that uh, ferric carboxymaltose can be given in post-transplant patient also safely. So we can conclude the talk. Iron deficiency is a common cause of anemia. Anemia and CKD is because of many reasons. And one reason is uh, less of erythropoietin production, but there is an important thing that iron deficiency occurs in CKD patient also. So we should not only mm, give intravenous iron to begin with before giving ESA. We should also uh, do the uh, storage testing like serum ferritin transfer saturation and store should be brought to 400 to 600 of uh, serum ferritin and transfer saturation should be brought to more than 30. And then only ESA should be started. Thank you. Hello, sir. Hello. Yes, sir. I, uh, I think, sir, uh, many questions are added in the chat panel. Can you see, sir? Yeah, I'm able to see Dr. Vinod Pawal Polwal has asked, what is, the, what is your opinion on non-dialysis chronic kidney disease on oral versus pharyngeal? Hi, Dr. Poval. So my answer would be we should prefer intravenous iron only because it not only replace, uh, repleted uh, faster iron repletion, but it's a convenience of giving higher dose also in the one sitting. On the other end, if we give an oral iron, the first thing is that we have, it has a lot of drug interactions with many other drugs. Patients of CKD already on PPIs, they're already getting phosphate binders and their appetite is already less. So many times we realize that we have to make a lot of arrangements in giving iron in such patients. So it is better to give intravenous rather than oral in non-dialysis chronic kidney patient too. So, I'm going through the questions now. Let me see. Sir, uh, I think when you scroll up your chat panel, so uh, are you able to see more questions? Like uh, Dr. Krishna Kumar. Yeah, Dr. Dr. Ritesh. Yeah, Ritesh. Yeah, Dr. Ritesh. I'm able to see Dr. Ritesh's question. He has asked, what is advantage of iron sucrose versus FCF? So, I will just tell you again, that what is the difference between the molecules? So, whenever we are choosing a, um, intravenous iron, three things are important. One thing is that how stable is the molecule? So when we introduce the molecule inside the blood, it should not release iron immediately because if it releases iron immediately in the blood circulation, it will cause a lot of free radical injury in the blood. Second thing is what maximum dose can be given in one administration and third is uh, how fast it can be given. So when we compare on these three points, ferricarboxymaltase is a stable molecule. 
so it does not releases iron immediately into the circulation after introduction in the blood which is a better point as compared to iron sucrose secondly a large dose of uh, iron can be given with fcm up to 1 gram uh, while iron sucrose is recommended to be maximum 200 in some countries up to 400 mg so we have a second benefit is that we can introduce straight away 1 gram of iron with fcm as compared to iron sucrose and the third is uh, the third the third point is uh, that um, the free radical injury with iron sucrose is more as compared to fcm and another point is that fcm can be given in very short span of time we can transfuse we can give 1 gram of fcm over 15 to 20 minutes while for iron sucrose we require 30 minutes to at least 1 hour so larger dose in a shorter span of time with lesser free radical injury is the benefit of fcm as compared to iron sucrose now dr krishna kumar tiwari ji has asked which is better in ckd erythropoietin or darvopoietin okay so although this topic is not uh, covered in this lecture i would just go ahead uh, when you look at uh, the erythropoietins were produced initially so they came in the strength of 2000 4000 6000 10000 and 40000 strengths also the problem with erythropoietin was the frequency we have to give in uh, intravenous uh, dialysis patient we had to give every uh, every time with the dialysis maybe thrice a weekly when we were giving subcutaneous we had to give at least twice weekly darapoietin had a longer uh, availability in the blood because it was a complex molecule so it led to release of esa slowly so darapoietin was given every 10 to 15 days so this is one benefit that darapoietin can be given less frequently as compared to erythropoietin secondly there has been some comparative studies also which have shown that when compliance is better by giving lesser dose darvopoietin has shown better improvement in hemoglobin as compared to erythropoietin so as far as if you ask about the theoretical thing which is better they are both are equal but just requires one requires more frequent dose administration than other and compliance is equal then the response will be also equal but practically darvopoietins are better because more compliance and better rise in hemoglobin has been seen in studies okay so dr ritesh has asked in covid scenario where blood bank are exhausted because donors were not reaching to them whether fcm will have some role to decrease transfusion my answer is certainly yes because uh, we already discussed that um, iron supplementation has led to rise in hemoglobin and in fact in one study we said that that too in ckd population in one group when fcm alone was given and in other population oral iron plus erythropoietins were given the rise in hemoglobin was better in FC, fcm so certainly fcm will decrease the need for transfusion if it is given on time in proper dosing dr shreya has asked in ckd patient transfusion iv treatment is best option in ckd patients we avoid blood transfusions the first thing is that it does not stay stay in the blood for a long time because rbc lifespan is less secondly uh, all CKD patients we consider potential for kidney transplantation. So by giving blood, basically we sensitize the patient. We sensitize the patient to produce antibodies against a variety of antigens. So when we do transplants, the risk of rejection is high. So we always avoid blood transfusion in chronic kidney disease patients. So we should take all measures to increase hemoglobin without blood transfusion. And that way, intravenous ferricarboxymaltose is good, good option if it is given with or without ESAs. Dr. Krishna Kumar has asked, can we give FCM before any surgery? Uh, my answer is yes, because uh, firstly, it can be given in a very small volume. So one gram can be given in 100 ml of normal saline. So we are not giving too much fluid. If there is fluid, is a constant. Second thing, it does not require any sensitivity test. It does not lead to free iron immediately after introduction in the blood. So these are the things which FCM has, and we can give well before the surgery. But the question is why you want to give well before the surgery. It can be planned one day prior also. Dr. Krishna Kumar has asked another question. And what impact on hemoglobin would, will be after surgery? Okay, so if you are if you have given before surgery, certainly we have expect that, uh, that it will help in making more hemoglobin. Erythropoiesis will be stimulated if it is iron deficient. But there are several parameters uh, which will affect the result one is that uh, how much blood is lost in your surgery and risk of infection after the surgery if patient has got some infection any kind of infection suppress the hemoglobin synthesis so that will affect the results 
Dr. Ghanshyam Sisodia has asked, what is the advantage of iron sucrose versus per inject? So, the advantage of iron sucrose versus fair inject is that iron sucrose, if you consider, the cost is less. But overall, if you consider that when you want to give one gram uh, iron with iron sucrose and one gram with fair inject, the, co the overall cost would be less with fair inject. So I don't think there is any benefit of iron sucrose over fair inject. Dr. Prafull Patidar has asked, in COVID scenario, shortage of blood, do, yeah, I've already answered that certainly when blood banks are exhausted, FCM will help to increase hemoglobin with lesser need of transfusions, depending on how much is the iron deficient people. What is the, so Dr. Akhlesh Dove has asked in CKD patient transfusion IV treatment is best option. So the answer is again, I said in CKD we avoid transfusion, we prefer to increase hemoglobin by iron as well as erythropoietin. Akshay Deshpande has asked, how do you find liposomal iron versus IV iron? Uh, frankly saying we don't have much trial on the liposomal ion whenever a molecule comes in the new studies they have smaller um, arms lesser number of patients and they give some benefits in terms of uh, storage parameters but the thing is unless we have a large number of patients and we cannot make any conclusion for cl uh, clinical judgment we need to have a power of the study to make a conclusion which can be generalized in, in clinical studies so I don't have much studies in my knowledge with the liposomal iron where it has been compared with the ferricarboxy maltose for IV sucrose. Is there any more questions, please? Hello, sir. Yes. Yeah. So I guess there are no any further questions. So with your permission, shall I conclude the session? Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, sir. Thank you for insightful 